a clipboard here if you want to get information um, around, particularly from the uh, Israeli peace movement and um, things that you don't necessarily get elsewhere, please put your name down. Yes. Can I just say something? And that is for someone who felt very badly about having to speak because of not having done so for a long time, I think you've really outdone everything, Michelle. I think the other two speakers agree with me. You do. And they don't usually do that. <laughs> 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 well, thank you. I'd like to say a few things. So, I, I am a South African Jew. My father was born in Germany and came and by a long route, ended up in South Africa in 1935. My mother was the daughter of Cockney Jews, so I, I was Jewish by birth, but I never ever um, practiced, I never had a bar mitzvah. The closest I think I got to being Jewish was being circumcised. And I think it was more on a health basis than on a religious basis. But being South African, I see a lot of parallels here with apartheid. I mean, apartheid of the uh, nationalist government. As most probably a lot of people are aware, and may not be aware, is that Israel was the main support and uh, main supplier of arms and aircraft and things like that to the South African government during the apartheid era. And I just see a, a, a parallel here of rule by fear, which is the way the, 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 the nationalist government are being uh, uh, ruled uh, by fear. To, and that's why you get terrorism. For, for as I call Nelson Mandela and his uh, uh, supporters, they were freedom fighters. They wanted freedom, they wanted terrorists. And I think to a large extent that's part of the problem in Palestine. Uh, in Israel with uh, the Palestinians that they support. I mean, a bloke that goes into a mosque will tell you what, and shoots and wounds nearly 200 people. What do you expect? Reprisal? Or just sit back and take its... I mean, they, you got, that to me is the lowest part of the issues. Is it very... Hmm? Um, I'm going to speak, and I feel some trepidation as I speak, because I think I'm going to be a little bit out of sync with the speakers. My name's Gail. Um, I grew up in Manchester from an Orthodox Jewish background. My story is a little bit is different to yours. It's kind of like reversed, not quite, but almost. Um, when I was 17, I saw Israel as the enemy. I was totally supportive of Palestinians in a very, very simplistic black and white way. I went to Israel. I went to. I met Palestinians, etc. Um, and I still am totally pro-Palestinian. I'm against the occupation, but I'm a lot more nuanced about Israel. And I think what you've done is present a picture that's true, but it doesn't tell the whole truth. You're not talking about the dissent within Israel itself, people on the left, and I'm sorry I didn't hear the other speakers, but Israel has got a strong, I know, no, you're raising your eyebrows because the right is very strong, strong at the moment, but there are a lot of people on the left. There are a lot of people who are tearing their hair out with this situation. And I can speak more clearly for the diaspora now, but I'll come to that in a second. But I've done a lot of work looking at um, the work of Palestinians and Israelis who are, tr who are on the ground, working together, trying to bridge the gaps between each other. I think that what the picture you've given us is one of the worst sorry, of the excesses. The yeah, and it's sort of cherry-picked the worst. And I could sit here and cherry-pick like the way, I know you don't disagree, but this is what this is about, a discussion. Um, I could pick those pictures out from the very right, and they would be also distorting the whole, which is much more nuanced, and I think that's the case here as well. You know, my brother once rang me up from England when the, the children overboard thing happens. How could you live in such a racist country? Well, we know it's not all like that. Yes, there are huge racist elements, and I despair at the way Israel's going, and the racism, and the, you know, 
terrible growth of that mindedness and I understand why but I also think that we will end up in despair we have to have some hope here and for me the hope necessarily isn't in BDS in other act actions and if, if you would just bear with me for a second I'll just tell you my experience of being a Jew here um, um, initially on the um, connecting to the left but now I'm a member of the Jewish Board of Deputies I'm actually connected on a committee there I've been a, a deputy doesn't mean that I'm right I haven't changed my opinions. I stand for, you know, a pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli kind of line. People know that. I'm just trying to point out that within the establishment, even though it's really heavy and they don't like dissent, and there are certain screeching people who would jump on you if you are out there, nevertheless, I can say from my own experience, both in the inner west and meeting lots of Jews around, there is, an, there is a lot of people who are very unhappy, who aren't necessarily on the far left, but are very unhappy about the situation. Um, a lot of people that are accepted within the mainstream community, not the right wing in the community, the boundary riders, but there's a lot of unhappiness and unease in the diaspora and I've just come back from England where I'm from same there like you know I've met with people from the Jewish Board of Deputies there I've met with people from their equivalent of J Street the left-wing groups you know there's a sense like we need as left progressives in the diaspora to do some more and our, the answer unfortunately isn't BDS that puts you over there we need some hope some some linkages and I was just saying this to Janet on the way so you know we don't want to be silenced, but it's not as black and white as all I'm saying is it's, it, the whole picture is not as black and white as you've shown us. I think it's much more nuanced, and I'm, I'm glad it is because the picture you well, paint is terrible. Oh yeah, can I give a, a, a yes. sort of response to that? That indeed, the, all of the, those little nuances, of course, you know, I mean, I'm in contact with people in Israel. You know, Facebook contact, admittedly, but quite intense. Of course, I know that that's there. And that's, but that is not what is reflected in, for example, the Jewish Board of Deputies here. So while the Jewish Board of Deputies may indeed, um, you know, have you there, Vic Aladef um, was insupportable. The position that he took that in when Gaza 2014 was going on, and yes, I know, agree. I mean, this is that is the issue that know, there is the I perception of monolithic Jewish support for Zionism, and it's no. There, while it is very important to say, okay, there are good things happening. The election result tells us that well, they're happening but they're not changing the actual face of Israeli society. And the same as what is happening here in Australia. Sure, there's dissent, but it isn't yet cracking the monolith. So and we, that's what we need yeah, to be able to do and I say, agree. here are the things that are really bad. Mm -hmm. And we need to be able to say no to those. Vic Aladev needs to be able to say, this is horrific. I want to secure Israel, but this it's yeah. horrific. And, and I have been at talks where people from the Jewish Board of Deputies have stood there in a room with hundreds of people saying that we hate what's going on at the same time. Those, those inconsistencies we have to live with, we sit with, it's terrible. But I take your point. No, I agree with you that unfortunately we have a leadership that puts out a certain monolithic line that follows Israel's exactly. right or wrong. But I just need to say, to be honest, to say it clearly, that there's a lot of stuff that is underneath well, that. Well, let's, let's it is on. tragic, but we need to, I, and I, I agree with you, we have to do this. I'm let's sorry, let's I've dominated, the but thank you very much for letting right. me say I, that. I'd like to say that, you know, I, I mentioned in my talk the fact that, you know, many Jews are uncomfortable with this, and it's behind closed doors. More than uncomfortable, doors. more than and, uncomfortable. Well, we long to do something. Hang on, just a moment. Let's, let's move on. Okay. And uh, I'm thank reminded you. what Lucy Stone said in relation to the position of women. She said, the heart of every woman is filled with disappointment and it shall be my life's work to deepen that disappointment till they rise up and tolerate it no longer. And that's the way I would hope with Jews who I know are deeply dissatisfied with what's going on that actually we do something about it instead of just constantly um, doing this in private. And that, this is the shell that needs to be taken. But let's have some hear from somebody else. Well, this is the guy that I did.
I'm just keen to hear your thoughts on something actually. My, I mean, my family background is my, my grandmother fled Germany, was able to flee Germany in 1936, and her whole family was murdered in the Holocaust. And uh, for her and for my parents, the Holocaust is very strong in their overwhelming support of Israel. Um, and I, I personally work with Palestinians, and uh, I spend a lot of time in Palestine, but it's a very strong generational um, friction between me and my parents and a lot of my parents' friends. Um, and something that my father and my mother always say to me is, your, your, your generation doesn't understand what it's like to grow up with the Holocaust is constantly there, and your generation is too far removed from it. Um, and so I guess my, my question is, I'd begin to hear your thoughts around, do you think that there is a growing opportunity for dissent and a growing environment that allows dissent with that greater distance from the Holocaust? But considering just what happened with the election in Israel and what's happening now, I guess you pessimistic, optimistic, um, but just considering that generational difference. Well, it answers that a little bit. Look, it's interesting that the Holocaust keeps getting mentioned when we're talking about Israel and Palestine. For people like me, where I have some connection, close connection, my mother turns 90 on Sunday in Montefiore, Mexico. I'm recording her memories of the Auschwitz, and I care a lot about that. What has it got to do with what Israel did to the Palestinians? It's an offense, and I'm doing what I'm doing because of my mother's stories. That's the right. question was always, exactly. why the fuck didn't the world do anything? That's the lesson I grew up with. You know, we're watching what's going on in Gaza and elsewhere. Where are the Jews? They're uncomfortable. Great. You know, that's not good enough. And in fact, I'm actually just repeating, because I've got the same background. I, was, I didn't get to mention, but I'll say it now. Amira Haas is very inspiring on this. She tells the same story of her mother, who was taken to Bergen-Belsen. This is her, her, her raison d'etre. Her mother told the story when she got off the, the cattle trucks going into the concentration camp. She saw the Germans, the, the Hausfraus, watching. And she said after the war, they can't say that. They don't know what was going on. And she sees her role as a Jew to tell the Jews they, don't, they can't say they don't know what's going on. I take that to be my job. And do you know they don't bloody know? They're uncomfortable. How many of them have gone to Gaza and seen, I, I was just in Parliament, I was just spent the last three days talking to federal members of Parliament, we do this regularly, for, as a group of Palestine uh, supporters. I've got a folder here with photographs, and I open up what Shujaia looks like. I don't know how many of you have seen that. Or have you seen the children in a, an ice cream freezer, the, the bodies of the children. It's harrowing and distressing beyond belief. And I'm sorry to say that I'm very unhappy about Jews telling me they're uncomfortable. I'm not saying no, no, I'm you, uncomfortable. No, no, I'm talking either. about the Jewish community. They're not no, doing enough. And the Holocaust has nothing to do with it. Only we should be learning from that what Amira Haas is saying. Our job is to go out to the Jewish community. It's got nothing to do with BDS, by the way. That's another discussion. I'm simply talking about stopping the horrors that are being done. You understand my point. And the Holocaust can only be mentioned in the context of what we should have learned from it, not what, you know, excuses for what Israel is doing, which is what they're always doing. And, and you understand the point. That can't be used as an excuse. Look, Netanyahu, to his eternal shame, keeps talking about Iran is going to create another Holocaust, the Palestinians, if we give them their land back, there'll be more terrorism from there. It's bullshit, and, and we shouldn't tolerate it. And so I don't want to hear about the Holocaust as an excuse for what Israel does. Dick, right. You know, the only thing there, of Sorry, I'm sorry, Dennis. Sorry. Sorry. Just I just wanted to say uh, something. So I, I appreciate how um, everyone's sentiments, and I relate very much to the notion of dissent. But um, I think what you're missing here, and I say this as a person who is Israeli and who has traveled from the right um, of the spectrum to the far left, um, I don't think that uh, to kind of have this, uh, the diaspora Jew who says, like, why aren't you seeing, why aren't you seeing, um, from someone who is from there, it's a very big ask to, from, to tell people, um, you know, to make that leap between like, I, my family who has fled the Holocaust and how have all this history have come here and you know, we are now here and we are here because we are here. And then to make that leap of like, we are the perpetrators of uh, mass genocide. It's, it's a huge jump. You're complicit. You have blood on your hands and you're participating in this. So the, the um, sense that, you know, the, the, the sense of like maybe um, distance that the Jews in diaspora have where you're like, well, I'm only complicit in participating insofar that I donate to organizations or insofar that I remain silent, 
I don't know, I feel like, you know, you were talking about nuance before and I agree with you completely. There has to be more nuance, but also there is this sense of like, you know, still in my head, there's still like this colonialist mentality amongst the Jews in diaspora. And I see this, you know, a little bit. It's like, you know, we need to to make all the, you know, all the conditions and, you know, emancipate the Palestinians. And it's like, well, actually, no, that's still a colonialist view. We need to create the right, we need to, we need to, like, create the, the scenario and the situation where there is a sense of equality, not emancipation of either. I mean, we both need emancipation, the Jews in Israel, or the Israelis and Palestinians. It's required of all of us. And so the, the idea of dissent, which I think is very, you know, um, important, and, you know, Peter knows my, my views on this, um, I just think that, you know, there's, there's a lot of, like, um, anger um, uh, towards, like, the Jews' is in action and silence, but I think to be a perpetrator and to admit that you are and to come to terms with it, that's a major step. And it takes a bit of massaging to get there and to kind of tell, you know, to push Vic Felderhoff, who I dislike completely, but always like jump and say, why aren't you saying this, why aren't you saying this? You just create a, a stronger, you just create a stronger right. Like you're just pushing him to the corner. You know, I don't see that there's a value in that. There has to be more nuance in massaging. You're saying what you resist persists, is that what you're saying? Sorry? You're saying what you resist persists, is that what you're well, saying? Well, yeah, potentially, but I mean, look at how it is now, you know? I mean, you have there um, a, an occupation that's going on for 60 years, but yet it's the Israelis who feel like they're being occupied. What's the solution no, to that? Well, well, that's our well, challenge. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe I've sort of got the wrong point here, but I really think that diaspora Jews have a very, very um, strong right to have very strong opinions about what goes on. I mean, essentially, I Israel would not have been propped up for this long if it were not for the ideological, emotional, financial help. I really and I, as a Jew, I feel very complicit in what went on. I used to put my money in the blue box. I used to go around collecting the blue boxes. I never knew that the JNF was just bulldozing Arab villages and planting forests on the top. I didn't know. So I feel, yes, but my, for me, my complicity means, gives me responsibility. Of course. And there's a difference between, you know, gently coaxing people forward and, and not, you know, as you say, not pushing them into a corner. But the way I feel about it is that as a person who really only started to see the, the depth of my complicity less than a year ago, the way I see it is that if Jewish identity, and it is in Australia, although I acknowledge that in Israel and in America it's not, and in England, but there is this monolithic sort of identity that we can't, there's no pushing them anywhere. We're not pushing them anywhere. We have to crack that open and say, well, actually, the right does not speak for us. Vic Aladev does not speak for us. Because if he won't say it, we have to. But he doesn't speak for you in as much as Bibi doesn't speak for all the Jews. And no one ever assumes that when Netanyahu says, I'm speaking for all the Jews. Look, it doesn't matter about Vic Aladev. He thinks he does. Vic Aladev doesn't matter. No, he doesn't. Vic Altadev is not important. Well, who's important is the community generally yes. and what they know. And what underlying your concern about how to make a difference, I think the overwhelming problem is they actually don't know how bad things are. They don't know what's going on. Of course you know, do. you agree with me. But yes. I'm quoting, I always quote, when I was there in Hebron, uh, we went with uh, um, Yehuda Shaul, one of the founders of the Breaking the Silence. He had a phrase which I always repeat. He says his mother doesn't know what he's doing in Hebron. Because to, because to know that, that if she knew what he did in Hebron, she would have to know that's that her son is... That's the point. Uh, this yeah, is, that's but right. this, is, this is my point no. exactly. You have to make... No. To make that leap is a very difficult step. No, no, I understand, step. but the first step in the leap is to know what's going on. We grew up... Do you what, think people what, don't know? People, people hang on, don't I don't know. Can we, can we look... Uh, let's open our... Just Let me just add one sentence. Yes, yes, you finish. Yes, we Jews grew up... This is relevant to the Jewish experience. We grew up, not just Jews, grew up with the idea that we had contempt for the Germans who said they didn't know what was going on. That was one of the key messages we got. And, and that contempt was based on the fact that if they didn't know, they should have bloody known. Now, 
So the first step is, yes, it's hard, of course it's emotionally hard, I understand that exactly. Mm -hmm. The first step is that somebody should be telling them, yeah. look, I have enough arguments with Jews that are still willing to talk to me, the ones I grew up with, a few of them haven't disowned me. You know what's the most extraordinary fact about this? When I show them unimpeachable facts, uncontroversial facts, they certainly didn't know, but they refused to accept them. That's now this right. is very difficult. So it's prior to everything else that you're right about. The emotional difficulty is coming up from the fact that they're firstly ignorant, and secondly, they... they willfully Willfully, that's the phrase. Exactly right. Now then what do you do? That's our job. That's why I take our job to them. Now, just before you have a second turn, Gail, let's see if there are others who want to contribute at this point. Yes. Dan? I rarely say anything because I'm not Jewish. I did for a long time, probably still do very much, would like to be Jewish. But I do not like being embarrassed by people whom I consider cowardly. Uh, where are the Jews standing up who will say things? And it's the embarrassing Christians, oh dear, oh dear. They roll over like puppies. Yes, yes, yes. God, it is so awful. It is really horrible. What can you do? I think that you must have more Christians engaging with Jews. Is it the fear of anti-Semitism? Yes, yes. You. It's partly your fault. You've got everyone so terrified of being racist that they are, er, uh, er. Uh. Now, it's amazing how absolutely thick my family are, and you attempt to, attempt to talk to them, and, oh, God, there she goes again, banging on about Israel. I said, well, look, I spent years at university doing Islamic studies. I spent years sitting in synagogues. Of course, I bang on about it. I'm waiting to have an intelligent conversation, but it's very, very difficult. Well, that's you have to have English. more interplay, but you've got to get more Christians willing to say to Jews, listen, you no, know, why are you doing this? Put them on a, you no, know, make them defend themselves. Don't let them keep on living in their little bubble where all the boys say, oh, you must keep out of this. Yeah, but unfortunately there's yeah. always that argument, ah, you don't know our experience. Yeah. Well, that is, yeah, that well, is the thing. Well, that's, oh, well, that's why, what we're trying to do. Well, that's why we've put out that leaflet criticism of Israel is not anti-Semitic, this whole conflation of anti-Semitism. Oh, I, um, I just want to be clear whether other people who haven't spoken want to speak. Because we've, anyone else want to speak at this point? Fred? Yes, I think I'm a small contribution in. Uh, for quite a while, I've been trying to get my head around what Ray Gator has been saying. And what, I do what who's been saying? Raymond Gator. Oh, oh yeah. Um, I do remember that he wrote something on the subject of the so-called controversy about the Shrawi's Peace Prize. And what struck me was he was talking about how a certain section of non-Jews to which I belong had become irritated with the behaviour of the extreme right Jewish lobby. Now that is kind of um, a red button, if you like, because who is going to distinguish between the sense of outrage and, let me say personally, exasperation about Gaza and the rest? Actually, my exasperation started with Sabra and Shatila in 1982. The point is, it's very difficult to draw a boundary between righteous exasperation and anti-Semitism. This is a very sensitive point for non-Jews. Okay? Yeah, we are. Thank you. That's why we keep getting called self-hating Jews. Yes, yes. Well, I get worse than anti-Semitic Jews. Just before we... No, let's let go have it. Okay, there's two things I'd like to say. I think that that's changing. Um, around, around, and I think that the the board of deputies and and the, what's changing? Sorry, sorry yeah. that opinion that about self-hating Jews, etc. Because I think uh, of the disquiet, I just want to, and there are official guidelines now about what's valid criticism of Israel and what, where you cross the line into anti-Semitism. And I just in answer to what you're saying tonight, I'm going to be part. Of, I've I've been involved with um, the Uniting Church Synod and the Jewish Board of Deputies in our inner West Havara. We've been in a dialogue uh, for the last half a year, and it's going on for, for as long as it takes on Israel-Palestine where very high level, their, their general secretary, our president and so on, rabbis, clerics, coming together around the table in each other's houses. We're trying to do best practice dialogue. We're taking it slowly, we're taking it carefully, respectfully, open-hearted, open-minded to talk about Israel-Palestine as Christians and Jews, Uniting Church and the Jewish Board of Deputies. You're not just being nice to each other. No, we're not. Yeah. 
No, we've spent, we took a year to develop yeah. the principles of dialogue and it's not nice around the table avoiding the white elephant in the room. It isn't. It's the hard questions and we're gearing, we're taking it slowly to get, the, to get our language right, to get our trust in each other so that we can understand the criticisms, the concerns, the concerns about anti-Semitism. And this will, we're not there to convert each other either. It's to try and be as open-hearted as possible to get the nuance, to get the understanding that that will help change people's inside. And I think the last point I want to make, if you bear with me, is I get what you're saying. It's very psychological, this whole thing. It's like when you know the truth, where do you go with it? It's really bloody hard and it's easier to revert into a safe place of, of, of uh, ideology or whatever. But what we need to be able to do is offer some hope. And, so, and there isn't much. And that's where we get, all get stuck. Right. But I believe it goes to be able to act. Yes, that's right. If there was something hopeful, and the problem with BDS is it just made it worse for the left in Israel. It got the right got stronger. So we get screwed. So you've got to find some other angle. Sorry. Sorry. I'll stop. Sorry. Sorry. Can, Can we just... just Sorry, that's that's a little bit organised. I just would like people to give an, again an opportunity for people who have not yet spoken, if they wish to, to say something before we move on. Can I answer uh, Peter, yeah, a quick word about yes. Gala? I'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. On the anti Semitism, let me offer a constructive suggestion if you're discussing. Sorry, Alice, please. We've done a lot of work. Hello? We'll talk later, Peter. No, no, I just wanted to say something about the crucial issue of anti Semitism. You, you made the interesting remark that the question is when uh, criticism of Israel becomes anti Semitic. I think practically never. Criticising Israel is like criticising any country. But let me add to this. Let me just add a fact. I just read on the bus coming in here, the um, uh, ADL, is it? The um, Anti-Defamation League in, in America yeah. has just put out statistics of anti-Semitism on campuses. It's the lowest since records began. began uh, now, you can check the data on this. But the point I want to make is that it is the, the charge that is always made, whatever the exact degree is, you know, and I think this is not controversial, the, the Jewish community and the leadership will jump on criticism of Israel and call it anti-Semitic when it's not. Well, I would disagree with well, you. Well, wait, 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 let me finish my thought. It's not a back-to-back, -back, please. Let me, no, it's okay. The dialogue's fine. We have to have the argument. But let me give you one example. I was at every rally for Gaza in the city uh, during August, and I spoke at one of them. And the Jewish newspaper ran this one, some woman wrote the paper. It was a, an orgy of anti-Semitism. That's a lie. It's bullshit because at every single uh, uh, meeting, someone got up and made the point, to their great credit, that this is not about Jews, it's about Israel. And when I spoke, I made a point of paying tribute to the meeting. Now, there was one ratbag with a Nazi swastika. I went up to him and told him to piss off. That was it. Now, I'm giving, the, it's not exactly secret what I'm saying, that they use the, the charge, as the lady pointed out, to shut up criticism of Israel because uh, Christians and non-Jews are generally, rightly, very sensitive about being critical of Jews and that, that inhibits them. I hear this all the time and I'm telling them don't be inhibited by that because criticism of Israel is... Now, one five point about this. Right. You can't, on, quickly, you can't claim that Israel is a state of the Jews the way everybody wants it to be, the Jewish community wants this, and then worry that other people don't make that distinction clear. You can't have it both ways. If you stand up and say Israel is not a state of the Jews, then if someone criticizes Israel uh, then you can, uh, and, and doesn't make that distinction, then you've got a point. You can't have it both ways. Indeed. Um, it was just a thought that I had, and I would be very unpopular to say it, but one of the <laughs> things that I struggle with so much is the notion of the, like, this, the commitment to the Jew and Jewish identity and I feel like it's been like everyone said you know um, you know I'm I'm Jewish but and this is my thing and I identify as a Jew you know although I'm not I'm not religious I don't practice or so whatever whatever however you justify your Judaism um, I think that the insistence on having Israel as a Jewish state or as a state for Jews that's where we've gone wrong and it should not be but I think then to, to get to identify as a Jewish organization that demands um, condemnation from another Jewish organization simply perpetuates Israel as a Jewish state. I get that. If you're if you're if you're demanding the, from a, the Jewish board of deputies to um, you know speak out, you know if you're getting them to respond to, for things that are happening in Israel, you're still saying that it's you're still maintaining its na nature as a Jewish state. 
I think we have to dismantle that. Yeah. We have to dismantle the idea that Israel can be a state, a Jewish state. Yeah, of course. But you're speaking as a Jew. So you're saying that you as a Jew should be also making that distinction. They refuse. No, but, but, but it's really like I feel it's, I mean, maybe not. I understand what you're saying, that, that by, by identifying ourselves actively as Jews and requiring other Jews Correct. to condemn Israel, yes. then we are actually going on with that narrative and we're reinforcing that narrative yes. that Israel is a Jewish I state. Yes, exactly. all, so. I don't I, don't I didn't that. say I agree with it. No. I said I understood. Oh, you're describing it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm describing it. I don't agree with that no. because well, I see where you're coming from with it, but the fact is that Israel declares itself to be a Jewish state. And acts for Jews elsewhere. And acts for and and says that it acts for Jews elsewhere. It, hang on, let me finish. Netanyahu's just, just done it. Just yeah. done it. He's gone to the Congress. Us. He's undermined, you know, the President of the United States of America, and yet he still holds his hand out to protect the Jews, to protect Jewish life. Um, you know, the rabbis that are saying, oh, you know, it's in the halakha that we must never uh, concede one inch of land to the enemies of Israel. You know, I mean, this is this is the rhetoric that is behind this state, that is propping it up. So it's disingenuous to say, oh, well, we're not going to actually identify that as, as a Jewish thing, because it actually is. And try as hard as we might, like, I don't believe in a Jewish state. I don't believe in a Hindu state or a Muslim state. No, not at all. But as they like to say, the facts on the ground mm -hmm. are the facts on the ground, and we have to deal with that and we're being made complicit, so therefore we have a right to take that identity and use it in the other way. My, my other, my, I guess my point is, if you're claiming of the, like this, the, the how um, um, influential the diaspora Jews are in the state of Israel, then why not take that narrative and turn it on its head and say, as a diaspora, like as diaspora Jews, we don't recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And you know that's that, well, great. So that, that was my whole point by by continuing to commit to. But being, it's still a it to is still claims to now. It is now. It is claiming that identity now. Yeah, but great it, will be the course, day when it is. Of course, but you can try and shift and influence that narrative. If the claim for the diaspora Jews that it is like the influential Jews that that we are then why not try and take that narrative and move it? That's the question to the Jewish Board of Deputies. The, the, the representative exactly. of the Jewish community should you're say... With, but you're dealing with a mass psychology well, of that's people. The problem. You're Fine. never going to get that. that. Let's, that's let's the problem. Let's, let's, let's talk in reality. reality. No, I'm, I'm, making a, pragmatic. I'm making a... That would be ideal I'm in making a real a, world, real polity. You know, we're going to have to do drip, drip effect. What are you waiting for? I'm well, saying there's a practical... It's now. It's there's, now. There's no, like, no, no putting it off. The representation right. of the Jewish community ought to get up and say, I can't go to make Aliyah and take the land from somebody who owns it. What have I got to do going there? Why doesn't the Jewish Board of Deputies repudiate the right of return of Jews? Explain because, that to me. Because the majority of Jewish that, people but in they're the Egypt, board. And, they're but standing they're up. They're representative. They'll go down. You know, do you know... This, yeah, Have you any idea? You know, no, yeah. you know but the psychology of people. Yeah. Come on, yeah. like That's reality. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. worried about yeah. survival. Yes. 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 The chair yes. has yes. yes. speaking, please. Yes. Janet. Yes. Janet. Oh, sorry, I'm just, I'm just wondering in this discussion, what about the fact that it, Jews in the diaspora and the Jews in Israel are worried about physical survival, the survival of people in Israel as Jews. That's... What do you mean as Jews? There's that whole thing about being surrounded by enemies. And I know, well, look, yes, they are surrounded by enemies. They're stronger than the enemies, but they are They're surrounded by the enemies. Yes, 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 mm -hmm. yes, yes. But the... But that is... You know, it's not like Iran's never threatened them. Oh, it's please. not like... Yes. No, no, but we're that's talking not, about that's how people yeah, perceive it. it. No, 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 you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I take it back. Sorry, it's not about right, reality. We're not sorry. dealing yeah. in reality no, you're right. here. If you're talking about perception, you're 100% right. Oh, well, well, it's perception, and I don't know it's the extent nice. of the truth. I don't think anyone yes, in this do. room knows the extent of the truth. No, we don't. Could I ask a question? Yes. Um, you know, I'm Irish, and I've seen this between Protestants and Catholics. Yeah. I grew up with it until my parents took me away during the Troubles and uh, still a, ch a child, but I have a very, very strong memory 
And as a child, you don't remember specific conversations, you remember the feeling of it, the hatred, the big drums, the irrationality of it and all that. So my family are Protestant and they hated Fenians and they, you know, meeting my, my cousin in China, uh, my mother after 20 years when I suggested that it'd be good to mix Protestants and Catholics in schools, how could you say such a thing? She'd been gone from Belfast for 20 years. She was, she's an atheist. She doesn't really know much about what's going on, but these feelings were it's still visceral. of the it's other visceral. being inferior, all wrong, were still, were so entrenched in her that it was still strong 20 years later. My cousin I met in China just last year, and the, you know, when you get to talking about loyalism and nationalism, whoa, the back goes up and it's like, whoa, we're, you've been to university about seven times. You're a very educated woman, but these feelings are still there. So my question is, do, 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 do the average um, inhabitant of Israel know that they have 200 nuclear weapons that they can defend themselves with? And a nuclear submarine on the coast of Iran. Yeah. Or, uh, is that a secret? The number of nuclear oh, weapons? No. That, that they know that they could wipe out the whole world? Well, and that they've actually so said that... Um, how can the fear... If the American, American if um, takes us down, we'll take them all down with us. As an American who well, also grew up with a nuclear arsenal, you don't... Yes, you know it, and it's horrifying. And I mean, I'm not speaking. No, I mean Israeli. it's there to protect you, isn't it? Israel, but Israel you don't feel, feel protected safe. by them for heaven's sake. So say. even if you have 200 nuclear weapons, I don't know how they feel. But I and your neighbours have feel. none, you're still frightened. But is that not so the state the working on people to make them feel that the nuclear way? Nuclear weapons aren't helping the Palestinians, or it's not a threat to the Palestinians. Oh, I don't so think so. not going to drop a nuclear bomb on Ramallah. That would be silly. No, no, it's not. A, not, not the fact is that they don't have a, the Palestinians don't have a tank. They don't have a helicopter. They don't have an F-16. It's not to do with the nuclear weapons. The fact is that they're under a military occupation, and they're supposed to to guarantee the protection of their occupier. This is such insanity. insanity. The, 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 the Israelis feel, and, and Janet is right, they're crazy. They feel that they're in, under threat from the Palestinians, from Gaza. I mean, Gaza doesn't have anything. They haven't got, you know, what they have they got? They have pasta. So, so, but you, Janet's very, making a very important point if you're talking about how can a country have been driven into this mental state, this delusional state, that they are fearful of the Palestinians, not the Iranians. The, the, and, and that justifies wiping out Gaza every few years. You know, it's kind of crazy. But that's what we have to address. But I think Sorry. Oh, excuse me, girl. Ben, did you want to say something? No, no, no. no, no. Just waiting. Oh, okay. 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 Um, I'll just make a comment which is probably not relevant in any sense or form. And I'm going to get very emotional about it, and I know this. But I've just come back from Jerusalem. I studied at the Hebrew University, and I lived in basically Palestine, East Jerusalem, at night. The human rights abuses continue on a daily basis. I don't know how the Palestinians put up with it. Peasant women that sell uh, herbs on the street are abused and pulled around by a, a police car full of four burly men. Boys are dragged off buses for not having the right permit. Kids are shot in the face before standing about an Isabia in the wrong spot. The fact that the situation that the Palestinians have lost it altogether is beyond me, but things only ever get reported when it is Jews or Israelis that get injured. And I just, I wish I could do something, but I don't know what I can do except be a witness to what is going on on the ground on a daily basis, and it's horrible. Gaza aside and all that, and Gaza, kids are freezing to death because nothing has been done since the war. No shelter, there's nothing, there's no water. There's I've given my winter coat to Gaza because it's the only thing I could do, because I don't need it. Yeah. You know, but it's little, it's not enough. It will Thank never you. be enough. Thank you. Because we all stand here and talk. Your oh, terribly important. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I could add one thing to that, you know your point is an extremely important point, to reverse the perception. The wonder is that the Palestinians don't react more violently more yes. often. Mm. That's right. And the extent of their peaceful resistance is the, the, the thing they're not given credit for. No. They stopped uh, even suicide bombing many years ago, and they're still regarded as violent. Uh, if you travel there, the, the extent to which they're committed to peaceful coexistence is the most impressive fact about the Palestinians. 
and, and that's an important point you make. And given this egregious violence to which, you know, two kids are shot in the West Bank every week on average. Two kids are shot. That doesn't make the news. Your point's very important. 8,000 Palestinians in the West Bank have been shot since the year 2000. It's not in the newspapers. So your point is very important, and their, their, their capacity for peaceful uh, uh, resistance is, is not given the credit that it, it deserves. So that's our, I take, that's the job of the Jewish Board of Deputies and all of us, to, to be pushing this story out of, out of the West Bank and out of uh, Gaza. I was there a year ago, and I've witnessed exactly what you're saying. And by the way, it's all very well to say, go to Gaza and have a look. We tried to go to Gaza to have a look, but were we let in? No way. Well, people, we are nearly half an hour over our allotted time, and not a single soul left, and this has been a, a gripping discussion, and I really um, appreciate the contribution every one of you have made to this. I can say there is some sign of hope in that in the recent election, the Arab parties united and are the third largest bloc in the Israeli Knesset, and their leader has just announced a major march on Jerusalem. And this may well prove to be as historic as the March on Washington led by Martin Luther King. Yeah. So I think these are where our hopes are, and this is where we should be working. Brilliant. So thank you so much, and thank you for Anna Marie and Kathy for your recording of what I think is a very unusual forum. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. Good. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. Very much. Kathy, thank you. Thank you.